Hi, Dr. Lassell. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. I can. I do have access to a slightly higher quality mic uh, if, if this ends up not working out well. Good to see you. How are you doing? Very well. How are you? Good, good. Great. Uh, all things considered. <laughs> so. um, all right. So um, I think I will turn off my video soon. Um, okay. I don't know if you want to open up the video or um, or wish. Um, wish how, however, you um, if you um, like having video open uh, for yourself, great. I actually can't open it now because uh, I have not yet had time to clean this area after I was playing with my son <laughs> this morning, and I no doubt problem. it will leave a positive impression for our discussion today. Not a problem. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to hand this over to Busha, who will be doing the interview with you. Sounds All great. Right. Hello, thank you, Dr. Lissot, so for agreeing to um, have this interview with us. So I'm just going to ask you to begin the interview by introducing yourself and what your research background is. All right, great. Uh, so I am Dr. Paul Whistle. I have a PhD from the Collaborative Program in Neuroscience at the University of Toronto. Uh, I did a lot of research in animals, actually. That's my background initially in uh, learning and memory, in mood disorders, psychiatric disorders. And I also looked at um, um, drug use, particularly cannabinoids, uh, throughout my research career. So I've covered a lot of things. At this point, I am now um, entirely devoting my time to teaching. So I don't have an active research program. I've since moved away from that. And I teach, and I teach in a variety of departments. I teach in biology, in physiology, and several psychology departments uh, in different universities and even within a university because Toronto has uh, two notably psychology-related departments. They have psychology, yes, and I guess it's not a department, but it's an academic unit is a more correct term, the Buddhism, psychology and mental health unit. And um, I actually teach in both those areas. So I have a longstanding fascination with um, mood disorders, with treatments for mood disorders. And that's sort of what took me into this area. So that's a rough introduction. And I, of course, can fill in details uh, depending upon the questions you have. Thank you. Um, so my next question for you is, um, how did you come across meditation research as a neuroscientist? And okay. why were you interested in teaching it? So there's been an interesting movement on this um, issue uh, for me. So my first exposure to meditation research was actually an intro psych uh, when I was an undergraduate student, first year student, first day of class, it came up because the professor was very critical or skeptical of it because research into meditation has been around like uh, for some time since the transcendental meditation boom all the way back, you know, late sixties, early seventies. Uh, there's been a lot of coverage of it. And my professor in um, my undergraduate professor was around during that time and working during that time and definitely a skeptic during that time. So initially he went over the research and, um, it was a, a pretty scathing review, let's say, of how it was done and the effects therein. And I actually didn't uh, have any contact with meditation again until much, much later. And I went on with this, um, I maintain that critical, skeptical perspective, you know, be open to anything being possible, but also requiring evidence. And I maintained that approach for a long time. And then uh, after my um, postdoctoral fellowship was wrapping up, there was an opportunity to teach a course. And this is funny. I don't know if you all know this, but a little bit of a backstory. Uh, the BPMH, again, the Buddhism Psychology and Mental Health Unit, had uh, wanted to offer a course on the um, physiological and psychological effects of meditation as explored by researchers. And so what was funny about this to me was they had this posting for a while and uh, the person they wanted to do it, as I understand, couldn't take it, and no one else would apply. And the reason no one else applied, I think, and I, I have no proof of this, but this is just my theory, is that uh, a lot of scientists were scared away from this position because they felt it was a topic that couldn't be researched scientifically. I felt otherwise. I applied. 
Um, and I ended up getting the position. And then uh, being, you know, um, at the age that I was, having no experience with meditation, I began a summer of relentless reading and endless conversations with people. And that sort of process is still going on today. But prior to taking that course, I had no experience with meditation other than um, hearing about it briefly in undergraduate psychology. And since then, I've done, I don't want to say um, done nothing but have these conversations, but I certainly had a lot of them. And uh, it's definitely been uh, formative. It's definitely uh, changed my opinion on things. Because again, the idea is it's this uh, practice of meditation is something that can be researched by scientists if the designs are done right. So that would be my experience was very limited before the course started. And once I got the position, I basically I met with meditation practitioners. I met with instructors. I even looked into uh, applications of meditation in the clinic. But I did most of what I did was what I was hired to do was approach it from a critical perspective of a researcher. So I read an enormous amount of articles. So I try and turn this into a positive when I speak to my students. I say that my experience is in doing research on meditation. I don't have anything to sell them. I don't gain anything, whether or not they love or hate the practice. I only comment critically on the research available. So that would be what I offer to the department, um, sorry, to the unit. Other people have, offer something wonderful and very different than that. Long answer, but I hope it touches uh, or answers your questions. No, it does. And it actually plays right into the next question, because I remember you mentioned in class that you don't practice meditation. Um, yes. And so <laughs> what is it like for you um, as someone who doesn't practice meditation, but you're basically teaching a course on it? Um, and especially its effect on neurobiology. And there's another question related to that. Um, sure. Like in your experience of, you know, like talking to meditation practitioners and like just reading, like doing a lot of research to teach your course. Um, mm-hmm. What are some of the ways that you see um, meditation research could be improved? Um, so an example would be like, a lot of meditation studies um, are not like randomized control t- trials yeah, yeah. and there's like a few caveats present. So yes. how do you see yourself? Like, so uh, yeah. those are two great questions and I'll try to provide uh, two separate concise answers uh, <laughs> this time around. Uh, okay, so number one, I will say that it's, it's a challenge to have a dialogue um, with people about a practice um, with which you have... Um, uh, like I've researched it a lot and that's my expertise and um, the practitioners will come to you with different personal stories. And it's not just about their familiarity with meditation. The reason most people get into meditation very often, and this is true if you look at the epidemiological data, is that they have a pre-existing problem like um, pain, anxiety, depression, or addiction. So the challenge isn't just uh, I talk about meditation, but I'm not an expert in the technical aspects of it. The challenge is also in relating to people who have um, different situations from you that you may not have personal experience with. So a lot of uh, this course has been about uh, not just me talking to them and them listening, but them talking back and me listening. So, for example, at the break between a lecture after a lecture is over, someone will say, oh, you said this. It's actually a little bit different in reality. Or someone will say, oh, have you ever talked about this in your course? And so students make a lot of suggestions. They make a lot of clarifications. And I couldn't appreciate that more. The course is rewritten every year and gets better every year because people add their own feedback. And there are, uh, I think, uh, two lectures in the course curriculum this year that weren't there at the start. that were added entirely as a result of the conversations I had since the course began. So I think one of the best ways to um, deal with these situations where we're not Um, we don't have as much experience as we would like as we listen to the community. So I think this is part of the reason treatments for addiction get better is you have to listen to the stories of people struggling with addiction. And similarly, I found to give a better discussion of meditation, even from a critical scientific perspective, you have to listen to the personal stories. So does that handle the first part of your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, great. That's my hope. 
Um, and uh, the second part of your question, um, in terms of how the research can be approved, uh, I don't know how long we have, <laughs> but uh, this is a very, very potentially uh, involved question. And we have several lectures on this, and I don't even know if several lectures is enough. All of research can get better. All of research is imperfect. I do have concerns about meditation research in particular, though many of those concerns have been increasingly addressed over the past few years. So when I started, uh, the field was populated by an enormous amount of low quality research, an enormous amount. And uh, this, is, this is funny because even people in the field would say this. This isn't me like a skeptical outsider saying, oh, the work you're doing could be better. Many authors in the area were saying exactly this, which is a weirdly sobering perspective. You know, you would expect them to aggressively sell their product and say, what we do is perfect and wonderful. And no, they were like, we could do better. So in terms of how to do better, yes, as you pointed out, randomized controlled trials are one thing we need to see more of. And we have been. And it's not just randomized controlled trials. This is an overall movement in research because um, there are some problems with how RCTs are done. Studies in general, they're funded, you know, through um, often through the public interest, for example. But many of the studies you fund never end up getting published and you never hear about them. Why? So one of the big reasons why is someone will do the study and it won't get the encouraging result they're looking for, or it's more complicated and they have difficulty publishing it eventually, they stop. Why is this a concern? A particular concern for, well, it's a concern for every field, but it's also a concern for meditation, is that these studies where there is no effect or low effect may not get published because they're too complicated. And a study, and the studies showing a strong effect are more likely to get published. And this produces a misleading representation in the literature that what's a weak effect is um, actually not an effect at all, or what's a strong effect is actually a lot weaker than we think. The way to get around this problem, and this is something uh, the meditation field is doing, and I hope other fields do, because I want to stress this is a problem everywhere. I'm not picking on the field of meditation research. The wonderful people working there, they do great work. You register the study in advance, and that way everyone knows to expect it. And so you're reporting in advance on what you're about to look at. And so if you don't report, people will be aware that that phenomenon you're looking into is more complicated and they will take that into account. So yes, more randomized controlled trials, but also registry of these trials would be helpful. And I think the third part of the movement is informing people in the area about good experimental designs. Uh, and this is absolutely necessary when you're looking for causal relationships between anything. Our argument is uh, that meditation changes the brain. Meditation changes behavior. That's a, a causal relationship. And up until recently, we had limited evidence that that actually occurred. Almost all the evidence for our arguments was correlational, it was based on, for example, imaging studies, which were great and informative, yes, but um, which weren't truly causal evidence so or evidence of causal relationships so one of the biggest things we need to do is we need more experimental research demonstrating causal relationships we need to um uh train students better in this area and more importantly make them aware that this high quality research can be done as i was highlighting earlier i think one of the things is people get scared about this field in the sense that uh, you can't really do a scientific study in this area. I don't think that's true. You can't do a clinical study in this area. I don't think that's true either. We need to get rid of that stigma. We need to educate people on the method, stress to them it's important, and then those studies uh, will go up in frequency over time. Um, those are um, some big points. Uh, there's probably, there's one more I wanted to get to, and it's, it's oh, last thing. In terms of the research improving, I think one of the things it has to do is uh, also talk about the implementation of meditation in the clinic. So one thing we do is we, we, we look for evidence that there is an effect, and that's great. But we also have to see if we can apply that effect meaningfully in a real-world context. It's kind of like we can show an effect of a drug in the lab, but you have to do a clinical trial to see uh, strongly support that it's useful. 
We need to do a similar setup with meditation where we need more like applied uh, studies there. And finally, I guess the last thing in terms of experimental design, when we're talking about good designs, and this is one of the biggest faults of this field um, and many other fields in psychology as well and overall, is they need, when they do studies, they need to consider the effects of expectation a lot more than they do. They need to do designs that factor that in a lot more. Uh, and this is a real problem. Um, and you've both been through the course, right? So you know I cover this a lot. Your belief in whether or not a treatment works plays a big role in your end response to that treatment. Many studies in this area, unfortunately, don't control for belief, make no attempt to. And we have to find a way of managing that problem. I hope that answers your second question. Oh, it does. It was <laughs> really helpful. Um, and it also ties into the next question I was going to ask, um, which is, um, so in the next 10 years, how would you like to see this research field evolve? Okay. So a couple things. Uh, more RCTs, yes. More registry, yes. Um, dispelling the stigma, yes. Training more students, yes. So I've covered all that. This is something else uh, I'm hoping to see is more courses in this area emerging. So right now we have um, like specialized education in this area. I think it's worth exploring a limited program to teach these subjects, at least a limited program to teach these subjects. So you, for example, have specialized courses in abnormal psych. You might have specialized training courses in cognitive behavioral therapy. You might have specialized courses focusing exhaustively on a therapeutic method or one disorder. I think, um, there's more opportunity to do this for in the meditation field. So you have a specialized course on meditation and its, and its benefits and a critical course, not just one that sells people a product, but a critical course identifying strengths and weaknesses, which is what I try to do. So that actually is not a change in research per se, but it's a change in the education, a change in the institution. I don't know if you're aware of this, um, but I'm going to point it out because it's pretty cool. U of T is one of the few universities, I think, in the world, period, to have a program for um, this particular interest. So this isn't common what we're doing here at U of T. It's not. There are not uh, mindfulness or meditation programs anywhere. There's not at universities. There's not a lot of courses on this worldwide. There's not a lot of them. It's more regarded as like um, more a hobby than an academic uh, specialty. So. If we're going to make any real progress, if we're going to conclusively determine how valuable these treatments are, we need to change our approach to education and consider some offering of courses in this area and give it a shot and see if there isn't real progress or real benefit that emerges from those offerings. That would be one thing I'd add that I haven't commented on yet. It's not a research change. It's sort of an educational institutional change. And... Um, that's, uh, you know, um, more complicated, but it's, in my opinion, equally important. Thank you for that answer. Um, I, I also think that it's, it's interesting to see um, not a lot of universities offer this type of programs. Uh, I know the School of Continuing Studies has like a mindfulness um, certification for professionals who are in the mental health field. Mm -hmm. And um, but like in terms of like undergrad level, you have this BPMH minor, right? And I think we were like I was talking to Professor Tony Otto last semester, and he was saying like how um, they're planning on expanding it to a major program, but like they were like doing surveys and all that. So I think mm -hmm. it would be pretty cool um, to have like kind of like programs dedicated to this. So speaking of um, education programs. If mm -hmm. you had an opportunity to complete a thesis or I don't know, go back in time and do your PhD on mindfulness research, um, what would it be about and why would you choose that topic? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, if I were to go back in time, I, it, odds are I would have leaned more to psychology than to neuroscience. Um, and that's not because I don't love neuroscience. I do. Uh, but I do feel that neuroscience doesn't love me back. Uh, so if I could do a more psychology study, maybe I would. I'm just joking around here. 
Um, what would I do? I would probably look at either um, mindfulness in the treatment of either depression or addiction. And I'd actually look at um, uh, particular addiction, I think, because I'm interested in how um, much of a difference perspective makes in the treatment of addiction. When you hear those personal stories from people who have handled these very difficult problems, um, who have gotten better, their stories are often uh, so different. And right now, there isn't good evidence for mindfulness meditation in the treatment of addiction. And part of the reason may be why we haven't found just the right program that works. And I would like to explore a different kind of program in that context. And I'd probably do an experimental study looking at um, whether or not um, mindfulness meditation can be applied. And if so, who will it work best for and why does it work best for them? I'd probably do a setup like that. This is just me on the spot thinking of something. Um, because the funny thing for me is that I've met hundreds of people in this area who have had that exact problem and meditation helped them. And when I look at the data, the data is very poor overall. So I'm like, what's the disconnect here? And I'd like to try and find out why this program works so well for a select few and see if we can't do something with that and maybe you know help a few more people. I, of course, with research, you always go in with noble goals. You, you're always hopeful that you'll be able to change the world. And maybe I'd do that project and find nothing. And if that was the case, then I would accept the truth that maybe it's not a great treatment and move on to another one. And that would be depression, I think, because uh, I've spent a lot of time researching depression and anxiety in other ways. I'm very um, familiar with the uh, changes in the brain that accompany depression. And uh, I would love to study how mindfulness interacts with that. Thank you for that. Um, th that's all I have for questions to ask. So do you have any final remarks for this interview? Uh, oh, geez. I don't know if I have anything special to say. Uh, I don't, I, I've done my best certainly to answer these questions uh, honestly. Um, this is actually a big field. It wasn't as big when I started. So I do apologize that if I've missed a detail or two in there. Um, and I uh, really want to say uh, thank you for looking into this. Thank you for making a part of the conversation. Um, it's nice to see that it's achieving uh, recognition and attention. And my hope is that the efforts that students like you are starting and along with help from Dr. Ju, of course, um, will draw enough attention to this field that we could make meaningful progress that we can do high quality research and really get the answers on these treatments and really, you know, um, see when they're valuable and who can benefit. So I think this is a wonderful first step you're taking. I certainly enjoyed talking to you. Enjoyed having you as students too. That was great also, if that's okay. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, the, suddenly the room is silent. <laughs> Somehow that was the worst thing I've said all day. Like I've been saying all this stuff like, Oh God. And then you're like, actually, you know, I don't think we were good. Okay. So thank you very much. Certainly. Thank you for asking me. Um, and I do recommend if you have the opportunity that you try and speak to many more people in this field as I have, because, uh, the more you talk people you talk to, the more you learn, that was certainly very helpful for me. And, uh, I feel it made me a better person, made me more open-minded in general. This has been fun. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you again. Like, I agree with you as like, kind of like a final um, thoughts on this. Like, I want this um, interview in this uh, textbook to be the perhaps the opening gate for many other like students, science students, scientists, teachers, profs to really like, see how neuroscience, not just neuroscience, actually just the science itself and mindfulness can create synergistic um, effect and how this can actually change what we're going to learn, study, research in next five years, 10 years or so. So it's, mm -hmm. it was really great to have this conversation with you and hopefully like other people see the value in this too. Yeah, it's, it's all these questions I think are worth exploring. You're never guaranteed the perfect answer that you want, but we have to explore these. Uh, I will add just as one more final thought, uh, it's amazing what a difference five years can make. So I've been doing this course now, it's like six years. This was my first teaching job. And even in six years, it's amazing the movement that's taken place, like the growth in the program. Um, I don't know if I've told you this, but this course started as 30 people in a basement. 
And now it's offered multiple times a year to 250 and they'll probably, uh, or more, um, they'll probably expand it again. So there's been a growth in the student interest and there's been a growth in the research interest and there's certainly been a gro growth in the therapeutic interest. Um, and that's just five years. The course grew by a factor of six. And that's not because I'm particularly fantastic. I'm not. That's because people are very interested in this. So I'm excited to see what happens in the next five. Um, yeah. And maybe we'll do another interview then. Who knows? When you're busy, uh, you know, with your careers, you'll come back and do part two. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, if part two happens, I, I think we'll have like a lot more and a lot more of a variety that we can talk about, hopefully within that five years. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, just actually, if I can ask this, um, just to make sure that I've, I've nailed everything, if uh, I at some point could see the transcript or have the recording as well, I want to make sure that I faithfully represented um, BPMH's goals along the way. Uh, I don't want to miss that in any way. So yeah, 100%. Um, if you could let me know when that's done and I could see it, that would be awesome. Definitely. Uh, and I also kind of want it for my own record so I could say, hey, I had this dialogue <laughs> with these people making a textbook. Do you want to hear it? I just, uh, you know, this has been fun for me too. This is what I want to stress for you guys. Um, you presented to me multiple times, actually, and online as well. This is the first time you get to see me present to you. So I hope it was fun. It was. It was a nice, like, refreshing break from, all, you know, all these, like, no talking yeah, so, for days. So here's what you can do. You can send me a mark via email and tell me what needs to be. <laughs> Just uh, as your last act of revenge as, a, as an undergrad <laughs> before you move on to, to um, your, your, your professional training. Anyway, uh, don't want to ramble too much here. It's been lovely. Uh, can I help you with anything else while you're here? Um, I think we are pretty set here. So like um, you asked, what I'll do is I'll transcribe it. It'll probably take a day or two to make it as like mm -hmm. a readable one. And then I'll uh, send it to your email first before we publish it. And then once it's uh, finalized and published online, I'll also share the link for you to have it as a uh, teaching portfolio or something like that. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Vassal. Thank, Thank you, you both. It's been fun. Thank you. Take bye. care, everybody. You too.